Hi, I'm Jonathan Jay and welcome to dealmakers.co.uk and also welcome to sunny Marbella. I am speaking to a group of business people on this video all about buying a business. If you'd like to access that training as well, there is a link somewhere on this video. Click the link and it'll be taken there. This morning actually looked like it was going to turn into a bit of a disaster. The, the flight was cancelled uh, and grounded because of a technical fault. So it must be something pretty serious for, for it to actually be, be taken you know, out of the air completely. But amazingly, within half an hour, uh, they'd resolved the problem and we are about an hour late. So everything's been set back a little bit. I was hoping to get an hour's nap later on. I'm not sure if that's gonna, that's gonna happen now, but we've just left the airport and we're heading to the hotel. We're just arriving at the, the hotel resort. Now I haven't been to this one before, so I'm very interested to see what this is like. And it looks really big. I wasn't expecting this. It's a five-star resort, so, um, I think it's going to be amazing inside. We've arrived and the first impression is pretty impressive. Very, very impressive indeed. So we are going to drop our bags in our rooms. So just ordering an Uber to take us down to Puerto Banus. Puerto Banus is the, the playground of the, uh, the rich and famous. In actual fact, it's a, it's a bit tacky, um, but uh, there's always some, some beautiful cars and beautiful yachts to look at. Welcome to Puerto Banus. Now, this is where the rich and the famous hang out for very expensive dinners, uh, very expensive boats, and some of the world's most expensive shops as well. In fact, if you want to spend money, this is where you come. So I think we're gonna get a, get a coffee and move on. So we're heading to San Pedro for lunch, which is a, a little Spanish town, three miles away from, from Puerto Banus. I've owned a property there for five years now, and it really is lovely one hotel uh, so hardly any tourists very authentic and i'm looking for a an authentic spanish tapas lunch so i found the perfect spot for lunch great tapas restaurant been here many times before and the wonderful thing about today is that the spanish fiesta so it's incredibly busy it's a great atmosphere and the sun is shining uh, it's going to be uh, landing back at gatwick uh, tonight it's going to be a bit of a, a shock shock to the shock to the system i think the dream of many business owners is to be able to operate your business from wherever you want so to be able to sit on the beach and everything still happens even though you're not physically in an office and that possibility is now a reality because we've got the technology to support it and if you've got a business set up in the correct way, it means that there is a reporting structure and a management structure that does not rely upon you. And of course, if you're buying a business, you don't want to be there all the time. You are the investor. You're the deal maker, not the doer. This resort is so big that we are going there by golf buggy. Um, makes me wonder how we're gonna get back from the room to anywhere. We need to leave an extra 15 minutes, could be late on stage because I couldn't find my way from the, from the, from the room to the, to the conference center. So please give a massive grown up business welcome to the magician of acquisition, Mr. Jonathan Jay. Thank you very much. Good news, thank you. Thank you, good evening. Thank you. What was the first business venture then? A magazine publishing business. Okay. So the first magazine was called the Student Entertainment Guide because I'd been to all these universities and I knew that they had filing cabinets stuffed full of terrible promotional material from bands and comedians and all, all you know, bouncy castles and all the things they have at uh, student balls. So I phoned or I, 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 I got a friendly entertainment manager to lend me his filing cabinet. So that was my database. And I phoned them all up and I sold them an advertising space in my student entertainment guide. I said, look, you don't have to send out this promotional material. You just buy one advert. We'll do it for you. We'll send out the magazine, which, which sounds great. It was a great idea, but it was terrible. There were terrible payers. I never got paid. <laughs> Uh, so I had to front all the cost of the printing and the distribution and then go cap in hand and ask for people to, to pay. And that, that, was, that was difficult. Uh, so that segued into a corporate entertainment guide where I had uh, better quality clients, shall we say. Where they so did, you shifted the customer. Yeah, they did right. pay me, uh, but it was very competitive because there were lots of different people after that, that sort of uh, that advertising space. Uh, and then I segued again into something that was a personal passion, if you like, of mine, which is personal development. 
And I was big into the Brian Tracy, um, uh, Jim Rohn, yep. Les Brown, all, all of those people in, yep. the, in the 90s. And I've actually brought a copy along with me. I've, I've, I've the last yep. remaining copy, if, you, if you'd like to see it. So this was the, um, it was called the Achievement Report. And this is from, I checked out the date, uh, 1998. So that's 20, 24 years old. I the remember, last, yeah, I remember last, seeing the this. Last surviving, surviving copy, Brian Tracy on the front cover. And it was brilliant because I could interview people for the magazine and talk to people that I never would have spoken to, but the magazine gave me access to right, all, right. Of these, uh, all of these people. Um, so, so that was the magazine business. I sold that in 1999 to Marcus Bonn Associates, which was a, a London-based training company, and they wanted the, the database and, right. uh, and everything. So that was my first sort of business sale. I was a subscriber of that. <laughs> Were you really? I was. I actually was a subscriber of that, Fantastic. Yeah. back thank, in the day. Thank you for no, your business. So, uh, every, every penny counted back then, I can, <laughs> I can, I can tell you. But that's, so, I mean, that's interesting, right? So the business really wasn't, I mean, was it massively profitable or was it just oh, marginal? No, 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 no. It was, it was, it was a, I call it a Loch Ness Monster business where, you know, the Loch Ness Monster photos where the, 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 the body of the Loch Ness Monster is above the water, below the water. And that was me. I was above the water, below the water, above right. the water. So making a profit, making a loss, making a profit, making a loss. Right. Net result, nothing, zero. <laughs> Right, but it gave you access. It gave me access. Um, it uh, maybe built my confidence in business. Right. And, uh, and, I, and I sold it for way more than I ever made running it. Right. And that was quite an eye-opener because I could sell it for more money than I actually made when I was running the business. Yeah, I mean, ever. now you'd say people are doing the same thing with podcasts. You know, generally, podcasts yep. are giving people access. That's how people oh, yes, the, yeah, you know, get access to people. The bigger yeah. the podcast yeah. gets, the easier it is to get guests and stuff yes. like that. But that, back then, that was way ahead of its time in terms of that kind of access strategy. Yes. So what did you sell it for in terms of exit compared to what the profit well, was? Thousands of percent more than a non-existent <laughs> profit, that's, that's for sure. It, it wasn't a life-changing amount of money because at the same time, I had discovered there was this huge pent-up demand for coaching in the UK. So I'd been at a trade show with the magazine trying to sell subscriptions. And if you've ever been to a trade show where there are more people exhibiting than there are people coming to the trade show. <laughs> Who's ever had that experience, by the way? Just yeah. Uh, yeah, it seemed yeah, like a good idea at the time. And, and you spend all your time talking to the other exhibitors. And direct, I can picture it so clearly in my mind right now, directly opposite me across the aisle was an American company called Coach U. Yep. It became Coach University. They did. And uh, all the sort of British uh, clients of Coach U. And I, and I said to them, why did you go to an American company to learn coaching? Because I was interviewing coaches for this, so I couldn't understand why they'd gone to an American company. They said, but there's no one in the UK doing it. So that got me thinking. Now, I didn't know anything about coaching, but I knew people who did because I had all these contacts from the, from the magazine. Right. Now, there was a slight challenge at the time in that um, I was running up a little bit of an overdraft <laughs> and, and, and running my credit cards to the max. And um, I'd taken uh, the car that I had into the garage to get it fixed. And they said it would cost thousands of pounds to get it fixed. I didn't realize you had to put oil in the engine, you see. So the whole thing had seized Minor point. Seized. Minor point. I'm not very mechanical. It seized up. And it was, it was either sell the car or, or not be able to afford to fix it. So I didn't, I didn't, have, I didn't have anything. I was, I was running every month. It was just getting worse and worse and worse. And then, of course, when you stop paying your mortgage, I mean, that's when it gets really serious. Uh, and, and back then, you could get three months without paying your mortgage before they decided to repossess your house. And I had the repossession notice. I had this idea that I could run a coaching course. And I went to the people that I knew in the magazine who were based in the UK, and I said, look, if I find the customers, could you run the course? And I said, we'll run the course. They, they weren't even going to charge me for running, running the course. <laughs> and uh, even you know, some people you may even Probably. know of, you know, Marion Duran, Nick yep. Rickson, people yep. like that. And uh, they all said they'd, they'd help me and run, run the course. So I had to go and find the customers. So I knew a, I knew a chap called Mark Remington. And Mark Remington had a, um, uh, a newsletter that went out. He, he, put on, he put on personal development seminars, people like John Gray, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, if you ever remember that book, um, and, uh, and, and people like that. So he sent out 10,000 newsletters. And he said, look, if you put me, give me something very light, it can't affect the postage something very light, I'll pop it into the newsletter and, and send it out. So this is, this again, last remaining copy. It cost me <laughs> £145 to get 10,000 of these postcards printed. And that's very dramatic because it was actually... 
So what's the headline? 145 pounds that I didn't really have. So what's the headline? Have you got what it takes to become a personal coach? Interesting hook. So where, do, have you been good at copywriting? Did you write the copy for this? I, 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 like, I like writing, so right. yeah. Cool. Yeah, so yeah, I wrote it, yeah. yeah. Um, before you criticise it, I wrote it. No. Nice. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I couldn't afford... See, anyone else spot the saboteur jump up and smack their head like, oh, don't, ah, no. So I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't afford a free post address, so you had to put your stamp there. Actually, interestingly, that was a great way of we weeding yeah. out, well, well separating oh, the they people had who just... Sample. They had to put a sample. So there was yeah. a barrier to entry then. That's interesting. So barrier from the marketing, entry, there yeah. was a barrier to entry, even though it's really small to have to reply. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, okay, so this cool. is our two-step marketing. So this Good is um, our free information request. They had to fill that in. And, uh, and, and so I, I, I gave Mark the, the 10,000 postcards. He put them in the newsletter, and then he sent out the newsletter. Right. And then I used a business strategy that we've all used at some point, which is where we cross our fingers and hope. Sorry for interrupting your video, but I wanted to introduce you to a great lawyer in the UK who can get your deals done for you. He's worked for 50 of my mastermind clients in the last few months alone. His name is John Andrews, and I've got his details right here in my little black book of contacts. You can phone him on 0345 241 2494, or you can email him on johnandrews.deallawyer at jmw.co.uk. If you want someone who can get a deal done, he is your guy. So let's get back to the video. And I, I crossed my fingers and I hoped that I would get a response. And a few days later, I got a, a trickle of, uh, of, of postcards back. And then a day after that, it was a few more. Uh, and then it was a, a deluge of postcards. They came back in the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And they came back from the post office wrapped around with elastic bands. And the, the, the postman would be delivering these in sacks. It was that many. And, uh, Lisa, one of my very first employees, who still does work for me today, uh, she uh, does some PowerPoint stuff. In fact, the, I think the PowerPoint you're going to see later she did for me. And Lisa would input these into our database, which was an Excel spreadsheet. And they were all asking for more information. Jonathan, send me more information. All right. and then I realized I had a problem. I didn't actually have more information to send them. Okay, so pause so for a minute, right? I'd so, thought that far ahead. So, so let's just pause for a minute. So what are the lessons? What's your marketing lessons from that? What, what would we call that today in today's world? Yeah, if it's digital marketing, what's it going to be? It's going, well, that's a squeeze page, isn't it? Yeah. It's just done with the, a postcard. This, it's just this, a lead magnet. Yeah, this is a Facebook ad. This yeah. is a, an That's ad what it words. is now. That's what it yeah. wasn't then, right? Yeah. So you, had a, so you had a really good lead magnet, yeah? And you did it as a what? That, you, didn't, you did it as a JV. With him, did he get, uh, did he did, get anything yeah. out of it? Was there, or was did it, it just, a, was did it just a, piggyback Did it as a favour? I, I repaid right. him in some sort of, some, some way. But you had, a, but it was a really, he had a really good target market, good list. Absolutely, really great yes. list. Yes, yeah, targets a list. Okay, cool, great. And then the response was just to get more information. More information. Yeah. So I had to sit. So okay. I sat, I sat down at my, uh, at my computer, and I, I put together more information, which is what they'd all asked for, and it was, uh, and it was actually this, and this is. Yeah, an original from, from back then. Um, I say original, but you can actually see the photocopier marks down the side of the page because of the sort of slightly dodgy photocopy that copied it. And uh, a little bit of clip art in the, in the sort of faded into the background. And I wrote this letter, and uh, that, that's the, the first page. That's the second page. That's the third page. Because you see, when someone asks for more information on something, they really want information. And if someone's interested in something, they will read it. And I mean, everyone thinks these days no one reads anything. But if you're really, and that's the, that's the last page. And uh, this was the letter that saved my life, my financial life. And I sat down and I wrote this pretty much in one go. And I never changed it. Even now when I look back at it, I think, I actually think that was, that was all right. That was that's, quite good. That's a sales page now in today's world. This is a sales, that's a sales page, page in today's a, world, yeah. right? It's digital, but it's not that. But, it, but it's the sale. Gary Halbert used to say, didn't he, um, that you're only, one, you're only one great sales letter Absolutely. away from a million pounds. You just you're one one sales letter away from uh, and, 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 and and this was the multi million pound letter. That letter. How so, long did it take to write? Oh, I did it in one sitting, like one evening. Wow. I just I just I just rattled it off. And how long did you use it for? How long did that was that the the main? Sort well, of you know, tool? you always think you can improve it. And probably I should have stuck with this for, for years. <laughs> I I probably used it for a, for about eight, eighteen months, maybe heading for two years. Okay, and it generated what in those eighteen months? Uh, we did nine hundred and thirty thousand in the first year. So it was a million pound letter. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. yeah. So asset, cash follows, assets. See how much time you put aside to create stuff like that because that's one letter, million pound payoff over 18 months. How long are you spending creating those assets, right? Because that's, that's an amazing million pound letter, right? Love so, that. So the, the letter basically said, this is what it is. And you know, I'd asked the people who were running the course what they were going to do. So I just wrote about what they were going to do. And if you're interested in this, it was a weekend course. It was just two days in a hotel near, uh, near uh, Warwick, Coventry, that area. And uh, it was, uh, and there was some follow-up after it. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it, the, the, the package was £2,000. And, and that was because the, that's the American company charged three and a half thousand dollars, and back then three and a half thousand dollars was two thousand pounds. Okay, so that's where I got the, the pricing from. Uh, and someone phoned immediately and booked. And I had the, uh, the, the credit card machine uh, ready. Uh, it was actually the other side of the room. You should see me run across the room to get the credit <laughs> card machine because that two thousand pounds was a lifesaver. That paid bills. Don't forget, house repossession. Flat yeah. repossession yeah, on, yeah. The, on the horizon. Um, and then we did the first, um, uh, the first weekend in October 1999. And there were 27 people on that weekend. And they paid £2,000 each. And it paid off the, the mortgage arrears. It paid all the bills. Uh, it got me a new second-hand car. Uh, it absolutely changed everything financially. Massive. Okay, so that was really, that was your test event, wasn't it? That was your test event? To prove well, no, the concept. It, was, it was a one-off. It was a one-off? Well, and I, and, I, and I, I, I didn't think that it would be any more than a one-off. I thought I was just really? selling a course. Really? Is that genuine? Yeah, you genuinely all, just thought it was going to be a one-off? And, and then on the Monday morning, after the weekend, someone phoned and said, I missed it, when's the next one? I didn't realise there was going to be a next one. <laughs> so I did another one. Then I did another one. Right. Before we knew it, 100 people had been on the course. And then it was 500. And then it became 1,000 over time. Right. And... I remember my dad saying to me, he said, uh, people keep coming. I said, yeah, people keep coming. It was a great product. People, people, people just kept coming. Yep. And, and that company is still running yep. 23 years later. And yeah. I'm very proud of that, actually. Yeah. Very proud. Ownership's changed a couple of times, but same, 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 basically the same product. Yeah, and almost the same marketing. They just do it online now into a taster Absolutely. event, and out of the taster event, they sell them into the, yeah. the, the certification. So why did you sell it? I got to the point where many people get with their business where they start to hate it. And I, I, it, it, I started to hate the business. Um, it, it, just, it just became a little bit overwhelming in some ways. I, I, I kind of reached a bit of a plateau with it. Um, there, there was a moment where it got very exciting again, and that's where I, I acquired our main competitor in right. 2006. Was that and, your first acquisition? Yes, it was. Right. So for five years, they competed with us, and, and a couple of my trainers, Neil and Vicky Espin, said to me, just, just market them to death. You know, just, just go out there, just keep pushing. Don't let it beat you, just keep pushing. Best advice ever, I just kept pushing, kept pushing, kept pushing. And, uh, and, and started to forget about them, but they were always there. We were always vying for top spot on AdWords. I used to do my own AdWords back then. It's very simple. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it now. I'd, I'd get you to do it now. Um, but back then, you know, it was very, very simple in you know, the early 2000s. I was doing all my own uh, AdWords. Uh, and then the owner phoned me one Sunday afternoon. I had his number in my phone for some reason. I knew who it was before I answered the phone. And I, I was very frosty with him. I said, Peter. How can I help you on a Sunday afternoon? What do, you, what do you want, basically? And he said, I've got a proposition for you. And I said, look, you've had propositions for me before. I'm not interested. He said, no, I'm really serious. And I'd like you to come up to Wolverhampton tomorrow to meet me. Now, I don't know about you, but I need a really good reason to go to Wolverhampton. <laughs> it's an amazing place. But he persuaded me to go up and see him. So I went up to see him, him and his, uh, his son who ran the business with him. And that was a Monday afternoon. So that was Monday afternoon. Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday afternoon, Thursday afternoon, Friday afternoon, four days later, I owned that business. So when someone says to me, it takes too long to buy a business, haven't got enough time, no, you can do it in four days. You can do it in less, but you can do it in four days. So I owned my competitor's business. That was Friday afternoon. No one knew across the weekend. I'm sure word kind of got out, but Monday morning, I went into the office as the new owner. You should have seen, seen the look on people's faces. Oh my goodness, the enemy now owns the business. But you know something, that acquisition 
changed everything. No longer were we vying for the top spot. I always felt that whoever got the client was whoever spoke to that person first. If they right. phoned their office first, or well, they phoned us and we didn't answer, it was lunchtime, and they phoned them next, they'd get the, they'd get the, the client. All that friction disappeared. disappeared. Business took off like a rocket. And then I did the private equity exit. So was, that, was that the moment you went, hang on a second? Absolutely. This is way quicker to scale. And, and when I was pitching to the private equity firm, it was, the question always asked is, how, you, how would we, if we owned this business, how would we grow it? By acquisition. Because we bought out our main competitor last year. Look what happened. And here's a list of competitors that you could buy out as well. They, they never did as it happened. But, uh, was that part of the pitch to private equity, though? Yeah, it's, it's, always, it's basically, it's what's the story? Right. What's, what's, if, we, if we invest in this, if we buy this, what's the, what's the growth potential? Yeah. So it goes back to something we were talking about this morning, isn't it? It was like, who are you going to sell it to? And what's their reason for buying it? And there's a really interesting um, thing the other day where the private equity guy said, they always ask the question, which is, who's going to buy it after us? Yep, absolutely. Which is interesting. And if, they, if you don't know the answer to that question, that's like, well, okay, great. So we're going to buy this. Or you might have mentioned it, I think, in the conversation we had the other day. It's like they're always thinking, great, we buy this business and grow it, but who's buying it after us? And if you don't know the answer to that question, is that they're a lot more nervous about buying it, right? I, I've, I've counted. I've, I've pitched face-to-face -face in boardrooms to 25 private equity firms, different things, whether I've pitched to buy a business from them, to sell a business. Uh, and, and, you know, most of them... Go no, it goes nowhere, but all, all, you need is, all you need is one. So talk to me about the deal with you, because like, you did, then you did the NOBU, uh, was it yeah, National, yeah, yeah. National Academy of Business Owners? Yeah, so, so I, I had sort of, sort of a business advice, business training, business consultancy that became more and more online as time, as time, went, time went on. But I had a, an incredible opportunity with, um, I, I was invited to a, to a dinner, and I don't get invited to many dinners, so I, so I went <laughs> to this one. And I, I was talking to someone before we went in, and he said, you know, what do you do? And I said, well, we do this sort of digital marketing -y type thing. And he said, well, do you know this company called Creare? And I'd never, I'd, never, I'd never heard of them, but I made a note on my phone uh, so I wouldn't forget uh, after the sort of copious amounts of wine that they give you at these, uh, these dinners. And on the, in the taxi on the way home, I, I Googled them, found their website, and I phoned up uh, some advisors that I knew, Cavendish Corporate Finance, and I said, look, these people might buy the business that I've mandated you to sell. And uh, they made a phone call through to the owners, which was Sovereign Capital Partners, which is a very established, very, very uh, renowned for various reasons, including being a very cutthroat uh, private equity firm in London. And uh, the word came straight back, look, they have no interest in buying your business, Jonathan, but they might be interested in selling theirs. Really? Okay. So I went and had a meeting with the CEO, introduced me to the chairman, and, uh, and, and they basically, when they trusted me, they said, look, you know, we bought this business uh, five years ago for 15 million pounds. The fund that bought it was a five-year fund. The fund is about to close. We need to exit all of our investments in the fund to return to the shareholders. That's why we'd like to sell it to you, and we want to sell it to you in a reasonably short space of time. Uh, but I discovered, but the reason they wanted to get rid of it, it was they actually bought it as the platform for a buy and build strategy. Uh, we can talk about that uh, later yeah. on. So they, they, uh, they'd never done a buy and build. They bought it, let it languish in the corner. They'd never really invested in it. I had a terrible management team, and it was losing £300,000 a year. So I said, well, if it's losing £300,000 a year, I don't really want the pleasure of losing £300,000 a year myself. Uh, therefore, I will buy it from you, but I'm not going to pay you for it. So it was a whole group of companies, it was seven or eight in this sort of network of companies, and I bought the whole lot for, for a pound. It was like a pound per company, but I bought it all for a, all for a pound. And I ended up owning 50% of a digital marketing business in Brisbane. That was a nice little, didn't know I was getting that. Uh, that, was a, that was a surprise. Local, yeah. that was a local I, one I, for I, you, right? I ended up with a, um, and I, <laughs> I sold that back to them. I said, I phoned them up and I said, I'm your new business partner. Hey, you never met me, but I'm your business partner. Would you like to buy my shares? So they bought my shares and they, they um, owned the company. They were very pleased, obviously, with that, with that result. So I bought this company called Creare. It was a, it was a whole sort of network of companies really and it was losing 300,000 pounds a year and they had about 85, 90 staff in an office in um, uh, rugby. Uh, <laughs> I know way more about rugby than I ever wanted to know and <laughs> went, went there so many times and in this huge, huge office building, massive office building. But I, I always say to people, never buy a loss-making business unless you know two things. The first thing is why it's making a loss, and secondly, how to solve the problem. But I knew why it was making a loss. It was overstaffed, and they were doing things that were loss-making. Surprise, surprise. 
Um, but also things that were very profitable. The SEO part of the business was very profitable. There was a core three, it was, it was turning over 4.75 million pounds, but there was a core part of the business, three million pounds a year, that was recurring revenue. Now, the best businesses to own are always businesses that are recurring, recurring revenue. revenue. Yep. Memberships, um, like, like gym type setups or subscriptions, because you have transparency over future income, which is always great when you're trying to sell a business, where they can say, well, in eight months' time, if we have this following this upward curve, you're going to be, you know, have this yep. recurring revenue. So, uh, so I, um, I, I set to work, and I was a bit of a blunt instrument with this. I didn't make any friends owning this business, that's for sure. And I went, to, I went and hacked it around. Uh, video production department uh, wasn't, wasn't making a profit, didn't have time to turn it around, you're closed. Uh, web design department, you're not making any, any money, you're losing money, uh, you employ the most expensive people in the business, you're closed. Uh, and, I, and I went and just sort of chopped it around, so I ended up with, the, the there was a strategy to it, which was to end up with this core three million of recurring revenue. And I figured out I only needed 12 people to run. The, and how many were there before? Uh, 85, 90. Jeez. Yeah, so Kelly, my HR person, went to work, and I know it sounds brutal, but I didn't have time to lose. It was losing so much money, I couldn't own it for very long because in that state because it was just losing money. And when a business is losing money, you've got to plug the hole somewhere. Yeah. You plug the hole with your own money, and I didn't want to do that. So, uh, so I shrink the business down, but suddenly it becomes super profitable. Now, a few months earlier, I'd spoken to a friend, Guy Levine, who owns a yeah, digital, guy. Yeah, yeah. Owns digital marketing business in Manchester. Guy, yeah. Yeah, we probably know Guy for, this, for, for you know, the years. Yeah, years, yeah, yeah. Years. And I said to Guy, I said, look, I'm thinking of, this is actually before I owned it, I said, I'm thinking of buying this business. Who would I sell it to? And he said, there are two people you sell it to. You sell it to uh, these people over here or these people over there. And I ultimately sold it to those people over there, which was Ad Media Group up in the nor northwest. I think it's called Thrive Media now. And uh, I sold it to them because they saw the value in the recurring, recurring revenue. revenue. Now, it was a pretty fast deal. So I bought the company on May the 3rd, one year, sold it or completed on the sale March the 24th the following. It's about 11 months of ownership. Now, I couldn't do anything for the first six months because part of the agreement was what's called an anti-embarrassment clause. Yep. Now, an anti-embarrassment clause is where they do not want you to buy that business from them for a pound and then sell it to someone else for 100,000 the next day, it would just make them look silly. Yep. It would make them embarrassed. So I couldn't do anything for six months. So I waited six months and one day just to make sure there was no <laughs> confusion over what, because there were pretty tough penalties if I did sell it or do anything with it in six months. Then I restructured it. I bought this business, I bought another business a few years ago called the Marketing Guild. So I stuck it in the Marketing Guild and then I sold it to Ad Media Group. And I did the deal um, 11 months, so I bought it for a pound, well, I, six, seven pounds, because I was paying a pound for each of the companies, uh, for a tad under 1.3 million pounds. Paul, oh, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Good job, mate. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Good to meet you. And you, yeah, really, thank really you. Good. Thanks very much. I just want to say hi, because I've been watching your YouTube videos. I think that went well. They seemed to like it, they clapped, they laughed in the right places, and, uh, and I, I enjoyed it. And usually when you enjoy doing a presentation, the audience are enjoying it at the, at the same time. So I think we made some, some good points. Um, we had a few laughs along the way, and um, yeah, it was good. I'll do it again. <laughs> Maybe I should do it again one day. <laughs> Is that all right? Yeah, no, yeah. superb. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. amazing. If you haven't heard him come speak, seriously, blew the room apart. Absolutely incredible uh, feedback out here, everyone. It wasn't what they were expecting. Oh, it really? It was more raw, it was more real, it was more transparent. They loved it. They're walking away just inspired, excited, and so many people taking so many pictures of so many slides going, oh, that's just a nugget, that's a golden nugget, it's a nugget, golden nugget. So, seriously, if you haven't had him come speak at your event, you've got to get him in. Just, he is. The magician of acquisition. So there you magician. go. <laughs> I quite like that. I know. Yeah, yeah. That's my gift to you. I, I, might, uh, I, might, I might use that one. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great. What a packed 
24 hours, it's now time to head back to the airport. And if you haven't accessed my free video training on how to buy a business without using your own cash, there's a link somewhere on this screen. Now, three very important things to remember. If you enjoyed this video, please click the like button, subscribe to the channel, and if you don't tap the notifications bell, you won't know when the next video about buying a business is released. So do that as well, and I will see you on the next video.